its liberators. Uh, at first, the invasion of Iraq looked like it proceeded very well. The fight against Iraq's regular army was a complete victory. But again, you know, it's one thing to topple a dictator. It's one thing to rule. It's another thing to rule afterwards. Um, and in the time remaining, I, I would like to explore why that's been so difficult in, uh, um, in Iraq. Uh, both because of conditions within Iraq uh, and because of actions taken or not taken, as the case may be, uh, by, you know, by the Americans. And, and I should just say as an aside there, I know that the United States led a coalition in uh, the invasion of Iraq and in the uh, occupation of Iraq, uh, but the, the rest of the coalition doesn't amount to 20% of what the, United, the American forces are. Um, most, most coalition partners provided forces numbered in the hundreds, when at its peak the United States had more than 100,000 soldiers in, in Iraq. So that, you know, uh, that said, um, I left you with the you know, American victory in Iraq, you know, the, the statue toppling in Baghdad, you know, an image I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, but it was clear as soon as Saddam Hussein was overthrown that the United States and its coalition had no idea what to do uh, in order to restore order and govern this country. Uh, base, basic services broke down very quickly. Uh, to this day, uh, electricity is not reliably available in, you know, in Iraq. Uh, also, the United States forces um, dissolved the Iraqi police and the army very early on. So, and they dismissed all, um, all Ba'ath party members, all members of Saddam Hussein's ruling party. So they created a huge body of unemployed, destitute men in Iraq, um, many of them armed and trained. And also, security overall was non-existent in the country. Um, uh, <clears throat> Iraqis were not safe outside their homes, and many times not even inside their homes. Um, also, the United States came into a country with, with significant ethnic and religious fissures. Um, and we can't say that the simple existence of differences in Iraq, you know, in Iraq is a cause. However, Iraqi politics and Iraqi violence since 2003 has largely broke broke da broken down along ethnic and sectarian lines. Um, of course, I think you all know that you know, the three major groups in Iraq are the Kurds and the Sunnis and the Shiites. Uh, more appropriately, the Arab Sunnis and the Arab Shiites. Uh, Arab versus Kurd is an ethnic distinction. Sunni versus Shiite is a religious, di religious distinction. So you've got Sunni Kurds, Sunni Arabs, uh, and then Shiite Arabs. Um, and again, I'm taking one step forward, two steps back, but throughout most of the 20th century, Sunni Arabs dominated Iraqi politics, even though they're a minority within the, within the country. Uh, now and throughout the 20th century, they've been a minority who dominated. Um, that was true under Saddam Hussein, as under previous governments. Um, but it's, uh, but at the same time, Saddam Hussein certainly sought to foster a united Iraqi uh, identity beyond Sunni and Shiite Kurds. You know, all, you know, all Iraqis were supposed to be Iraqis, loyal, of course, only to Saddam Hussein. Uh, and, <clears throat> and when there were Shiite or Kurdish uh, separatist movements or movements for, for, for autonomy. Saddam Hussein certainly ruthlessly suppressed them. But it's not like you had this 
a completely divided society before, uh, before the invasion. Um, one of the major fallouts of the invasion was that Sunni Arabs feared, and, and, and rightly so, that their position was going to be greatly diminished. The Kurds had been virtually autonomous for almost 10 years, uh, for reasons I can get into in the Q&A. Uh, the Shiites were much more numerous. And while uh, you know, Iraq certainly had a mixed population, that, that is to say, you didn't have one area that was all Sunnis, one area that was all Shiites, still Sunnis were concentrated largely in regions of the country that had fewer natural resources and particularly less, less access to oil. So since the, you know, since the invasion on the political level, um, one of the major conflicts within Iraq has been how power and resources are to be shared among, you know, among these different groups. Um, and, uh, you know, and once the, you know, once the American uh, viceroy, as, it, as he was, sorry, proconsul, as he was called, uh, turned over authority to, a, you know, to an interim government in, in Iraq. Uh, since then, elections and, and political parties have largely, uh, largely been formed along these ethnic and sectarian lines. And, the, and again, the big question is how will power and resources be shared among, the, you know, among these groups? And I should add, by the way, that um, in addition to these ethnic and sectarian divisions on the political level, you also have a multitude of parties competing for the, for the votes and support of each, each of these sectors of the population. So it's not like there's one Shiite party, one Kurdish party, you know, one, Su one Sunni party. There's a wide variety of parties um, so, that the, you know, so that Iraqi polit politicians have been seen as fractious and not particularly effective. Um, this is not especially surprising considering as I mentioned, some basic services still are not operational. Uh, still, corruption is a major problem. Uh, it takes a huge amount of bribery to get anything done in Iraq. Uh, and also, there is the problem of ongoing violence in Iraq. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's the last issue that I would like to address. Um, this is something that's very important for Iraqis in their daily lives, and it's important for American forces who are supposed to withdraw from Iraq by the end of this year. Um, so when I mentioned the fall of Saddam Hussein and some of the problems, one of the problems that I mentioned immediately was a lack of security. Um, this wasn't just at the personal level. Looting was endemic. Uh, one scholar has described the situation as one where looting replaced shopping. Um, so uh, so you, know, you may remember scenes from the Iraqi National Museum being looted. The same thing happened to many Iraqi arson arsenals. So in a situation where the Iraqi police had been dismissed, American forces were unable to restore civil order. Arms were readily available, and individual Iraqis saw them as necessary. Um, very quickly, almost every Iraqi at least had an assault rifle to defend themselves and, you know, and their family. Um, uh, and other looters acquired even more power, powerful wef, weapons or materials to make car bombs and the weapons of the last 10 years, namely the improvised explosive device, or IED. Uh, at the same time, I should add that Iraq's borders were not secured. So, uh, you know, so that foreign fighters who wanted to liberate Iraq 
from its occupiers, just as foreign fighters had sought to liberate Afghanistan from its occupiers. It, it was fairly easy for those foreign fighters and, fo and foreign support to pour into the country. Though I should note that that remained true only so long as the Iraqi people saw these foreigners as an aid to overthrowing occupation and not a threat to Iraqis themselves. And, um, and that's an important thing to remember about, um, you know, about uh, some later, you know, you know, later developments in, you know, in Iraq. So very, very shortly after the invasion, uh, it was clear that there was an organized counter counterinsurgency. Um, within months of the invasion, Ameri you know, American officials said yes. There, sorry, not counterinsurgency, a real insurgency. Uh, hopefully, it there was a counterinsurgency at the same time. Um, but um, you know, but this this was by summer of 2003. And as I said, you know, Iraqi society was breaking down along sectarian lines. Um, I can talk in the Q&A about the development of that if, if you would like. But uh, by 2006 and, two, and 2007, um, people feared that Iraq was on the brink of civil war. Or the debate was what to call the, you know, the fratricidal violence of Sunni versus, versus Shiite with tens of thousands of people killed uh, you know, in, in each of those years. Um, since then, since that peak in 2006 and 2007, um, there, ha there has been a decline in, uh, in violence against civilians. Most Americans are aware of the American actions, the, you know, the surge. Uh, in, 2000, in 2007, uh, George W. Bush sent uh, you know, an additional uh, 28,500 uh, soldiers to Iraq. Um, may, some may be also aware of other American actions, namely the Iraqi awakening where American forces basically went to Sunni groups, I I Iraqi Sunni groups, that had formerly been uh, fighting against the occupation. And, they, and the Americans said, look, you hate these foreign fighters and Al-Qaeda as much as we do, and we're willing to pay you to come over to our side. So that was another key point. In, in the decline of violence. Um, and it's also worth noting that by that time, there were, there, were, there were fewer Sunnis in Shiite neighborhoods to kill. There were fewer Shiites in Sunni neighborhoods to kill or, you know, or kidnap. Iraq was largely ethnically cleansed. Uh, so, those, th those three factors in 2006, some of them related to American action, some of them not, uh, have led to a decline in violence in Iraq. And uh, in 2010, you know, just as um, you know, coalition forces in Afghanistan were seeing their heaviest casualties, 2010 saw the lowest levels of civilian death from violence in Iraq since the war began. 4,045 4, people, by the best estimates, were killed uh, in violent attacks of one, one kind or another. That's what a good year looked like. Um, so, the, so even though the situation has improved, security remains, it remains elusive. Um, one organization, Iraqi Body Count, has said that the 2010 data suggest a persistent low-level conflict in Iraq that will continue to kill civilians at a similar rate for, you know, for years to come. Um, you know, this kind of violence uh, plus you know, 
uh, measures of, you know, of other, other, dire other deaths indirectly caused by the invasion and occupation have resulted in Iraqi casualties ranging from 100,000 to a million. I mean, th nobody knows any more precisely than that. You know, the, um, you've got people de debating on that kind of a scale. Um, regardless, even the low figure is, you know, is incredibly high. Um, and that's to say nothing of the crises fa you know, facing uh, Iraqi refugees, internally displaced persons, and minority religious groups, uh, the, you know, groups that aren't Sunni or, Sunni or Shiite. Um, so, as, so you know, as we remember the September 11th attacks this week, uh, and we talk about its consequences for, for Americans, and think about where we've, we've come as a country, uh, it's important to remember what the consequences have been for others as well, you know, most notably in the Middle East. Um, by invading Iraq and, and Afghanistan, the United States did remove dictatorial regimes. Uh, however, the, you know, the aftermath of those victories in, in toppling dictators uh, have had severe consequences for the inhabitants of those countries. Uh, I believe that it is both a moral and a practical duty to re remember this um, so that we do not repeat these mistakes uh, and so that we are not responsible for this kind of harm across the world and so that we do not harm ourselves in the process. Thank you.